Good evening, everybody. Welcome to today's topic, Develop and Establish a Business Improvement Strategy, Your Implementation Plan. This webinar is being conducted with Alan Power and Informa. Uh, before we hand the phone over to Alan, I'd just like to discuss a couple of housekeeping points with you to tide you through the session. Slides will be available on our slide share page and the link will be emailed to you a couple of days after the webinar. The recording of the webinar will also be available to download. Please take time to complete the post-webinar survey that will pop up at the end. You can also type your questions throughout the session. However, time will be allocated in the end for the speaker to address your questions. Today's speaker is Alan Power. Alan has a wide range of business experience spanning over 40 years, during which he has held a number of senior positions in management development and training, resource management, operations management, and quality management in the UK finance sector. Currently, Alan operates as a freelance, offering training and consultancy services in operations management, quality management, business excellence, Lean Operations, Six Sigma, and together with a range of associated business practices. Alan is also a member of the Institute of Operations Management and a fellow of the Chartered Management Institute. Welcome, Alan. Good afternoon or good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are and whatever the time of day it is, where you are. I look forward to spending a little bit of time with you, talking you through an implementation strategy to do with quality management systems. Uh, just to reinforce uh, the point that Delna, the previous speaker, has made to you, um, I'll be talking to you about my personal experience. I, I'm not... Um, uh, well, well uh, adopted to speak to you about theory. I want to talk to you about things that I've done and things that have worked for me. So if I would just turn to the first slide, what I'm going to do is try and give you some indication of the sequence of events that you will be required to follow to introduce a business improvement strategy in your company. Uh, generally speaking, the steps should follow the sequence that I'm going to outline to you, though you'll find as we go through that, um, those steps, that some of them actually could be done in a slightly different order, and sometimes you'll find that some of the steps can be car carried out in parallel. But when that happens, I'll mention that to you. So, um, again, as Delna said, there may be some questions that um, arise as I'm going through these steps. If you could just note those questions or maybe pose your questions online, I won't be able to answer them when you pose the questions, but at the end of the, the session, I shall leave sufficient time to, um, to address those questions. When we come to the end, I'll remind you about questions, and if you want to leave your questions until the end, then feel free to do so. So, shall we start? Okay. Um, you can see on this slide here, it says stage one information. Uh, let me say that all the slides will be in this format. So they'll all say stage something, stage one, stage two, and so on. And there'll be a heading. What I've tried to do is use similar types of words for the heading. And as you'll see that as we go through the, uh, the webinar, that all the words end with T-I-O-N, uh, just to give you maybe something to help you to, to remember the steps. So the first stage is information, and this is when the senior management team in an organization find out about different opportunities that they can explore to um, develop a strategy in quality management or business improvement. Generally speaking, but not always, the senior management team invites an external consultant to come out, to come in and deliver a short presentation, and in my experience, this has involved 
introducing them to a number of methodologies and together with a number of options for implementation. Generally speaking, again, and very typically, the options would include those that I put on the list in front of you. So number one, which talks about self-assessment using an excellence model, is an approach where we take something like the European Foundation for Quality and Management Business Excellence Model, which is purports to define what world-class operations look like, and then gives you the opportunity to compare your business performance, your business operation, with those that are outlined in the excellence model, inviting you then to do a gap analysis. A gap analysis determines what you have to do to move you from where you are to, to, be, to being excellent, and uh, you then pursue a series of initiatives to, uh, to achieve excellence. Uh, this you may have come across in places like Dubai because it's part of the approach to the Dubai Quality Award. If you're in Abu Dhabi, it's the Sheikh Khalifa Award. Uh, each country has their own titles for these awards, but they're all based on the same model, the European Excellence Model. Uh, the second one is Lean Operations. Um, I suspect you will have all known about the Toyota production system. If you're interested in quality management, you'll know about the success that has been achieved in many organizations in Japan, uh, with Toyota being probably the, uh, the benchmark organization. Lean Operations is um, an approach that is based on the Toyota production system. And if you read the book, the word lean was coined by a couple of people who wrote a book called the machine that changed the world. Uh, these guys were called Womack and Jones. Um, and in that book, they coined the expression lean. Uh, lean was how they described the Toyota production system. In other words, there's not a lot of fat in it. There's not a lot of waste. And that's an approach that lots of organizations adopt, the Toyota production system to reduce waste in an organization. The third methodology uh, is Six Sigma, again, something that I would imagine you've heard of, differs from lean operations, but has been extensively used in Toyota and other Japanese organizations since the 1950s and picked up by many organizations around the globe since. And the expression Six Sigma was actually coined by Motorola in 1986 uh, when they adopted a strategy for business improvement that mimicked what it was that was um, being done in in the, with the Toyota production system and other systems. Six Sigma is about reducing variation, about understanding process performance, so that you can uh, reduce errors, reduce defects, and as a result, make your processes more predictable so you can forecast uh, um, a delivery to a customer or you can, you can work out the resource requirements because, the, as I said, the process is more predictable. The fourth item there is benchmarking. Uh, benchmarking is about comparing your business with other businesses, four different types of benchmarking. Uh, you can compare your business with a business that's very like yours, a competitor, uh, which will give you enormous benefits, but it's very difficult to, um, to get your competitors to tell you how to beat them. Um, there are ways around it, but it's one of the uh, most significant ways of improving your business. There's internal benchmarking as well as competitive benchmarking. Internal is using, um, in organizations where you've got similar types of businesses, so for example, if you're working in a bank and you've got lots of branches, you can compare one branch against another branch in terms of their performance. Uh, therefore, you've got an, inter an internal benchmark to help you improve. Again, that's easy to do, but you're looking at an internal benchmark rather than looking at where the real competition lies. Uh, the third element of benchmarking is functional benchmarking, where you will compare maybe a HR department in your company with an HR department in another company, or a finance department, or an IT department, or whatever. And the fourth element of benchmarking is about generic benchmarking, where you can take anything that you do and compare it with anything that anybody else does. Uh, it might sound a little strange, but I know of a furniture company that um, created the 
touch opening drawers and touch opening doors in kitchens, uh, they discover them that, that approach by benchmarking with a Saab jet aircraft, just to illustrate the point. Uh, the fifth one is the balanced scorecard. Uh, balanced scorecard is an approach for gathering information on KPIs, business metrics, four categories, uh, learning and growth, internal process, customer and finance, or other business um, results, and using those as an improvement tool to measure your progress towards a long to medium term vision. Uh, most organizations in the world nowadays use the balanced scorecard. I think probably every world-class company uses them. Um, and they use them to develop strategy, and they use them to measure and monitor progress towards strategy. Item six is ISO standards. Uh, this is something that's very popular around the globe. An ISO standard is a, uh, an international standard. ISO, most people think... Uh, st um, stands for International Standards Organization. It doesn't quite stand for that, but it's, you don't need to know much, much more about it than that. It's about an international standard. It gives customers um, internationally confidence that you've achieved a particular level of compliance to, um, to a standard. There are many of them, the most popular being ISO 9001 and the ISO 9000 family of standards. What you need to do is understand the standard, train your people, uh, document your approaches, show to an external auditor that you do what you say you do, and as a consequence of complying to that, then you would achieve accreditation or certification. You can then put your ISO standard, your stamp if you like, on your internal documentation, on your website or anything else that your customers see, just to show that you've reached a certain performance level. There are many, many ISO standards. I mentioned ISO 9001, but there are several hundred of them. Um, and obviously, we don't have time to go through any of those today. But what I'm saying, therefore, is that typically a consultant like myself would go to an organization and spend a little time, maybe half a day, describing those six approaches to delivering a quality management system and spending a little bit of time about talking about the implementation options. But essentially what I am would be trying to do is to put the senior management um, team in a position to make a choice. What do, we, what do they want to do? What's going to be appropriate for their company? What's going to be appropriate for the particular level of maturity of their particular company? Um, very often, people will pick a simple approach as a starting point, like an ISO standard or lean operations. Some people actually mix some of them. They'll do lean and Six Sigma together. Um, but generally speaking, self-assessment against the excellence model is one that is typically used at the end. So you'll introduce something like lean or Six Sigma benchmarking, an ISO standard, and so on. Once that's done, then you can do self-assessment maybe a year or so later to see how you're comparing with international companies. So having presented for about a half a day um, on those six subjects, then I would leave the company to make some decisions to reflect and to maybe uh, discuss, maybe on the telephone, maybe for me to return, maybe to communicate via email to um, put them in a position where they feel confident to make a, a decision. That's when we move on to the next stage. Okay, and this is where we go into this, the actual decision making. And it's important at this stage that commitment is achieved. It's all very well them saying, yes, we want to do this in this particular way, but it only works if everybody in the senior management team indicates their level of commitment. Uh, I, I've known some organizations to put the commitment in writing, and get every senior management, every senior member of the management team to sign the document, illustrating their commitment. I have also known, uh, at the other end of the, the scale, I've known situations arise where most of the management team sign up, but one or maybe two people have indicated that they're not comfortable to sign up, and so the chief executive has been 
known to invite them to resign, which I think is, um, I'm not suggesting you do that, but I think it's uh, a very powerful message that if you're not on board with um, our quality management system, then we'd like to bring people in who are on board. Okay, stage three is about organization. So you've now decided which approach you're going to take. Now you need to start to organize yourself so that you can execute. In an org the organization stage, we spend a little bit of time thinking about what our quality policy is. Uh, we need to write something down about our policy with regard to quality management. We may need, in some organizations, to develop an internal infrastructure to support implementation. We may need to appoint a senior manager who is to be accountable to the board for results. Uh, we need, may need to set up a permanent resource to work full-time on improvement initiatives. It all depends on the size of organization. You know, Medium organized, medium sized and large organizations would typically appoint a senior manager to be accountable to the board. They would typically appoint permanent resources to work full time on improvement initiatives. Smaller organizations may actually bring in consultancy support. I'm not suggesting that medium sized or larger organizations wouldn't bring in consultancy support. They often do. But um, smaller organizations typically can't justify establishing permanent resources. Doing that, I've got at the bottom, the duration for doing that is typically about a month. And again, it all depends on the company. It all depends how organized they are, how committed they are, and how, how urgently they feel that there is a need to establish a quality management system in their company. So that's stage three. I can move on to stage four, which is about communication. Communication is critical. People who work in the organization need to understand what's going on. I'd strongly recommend that when you're doing something like this, if you've got a, a new business improvement strategy, that you have a strategy for communications as well. People need to be told regularly, and I'm talking about every week uh, as a minimum, about what's happening, how it in, impacts on them, how they're to be involved, and, and so on. And by the way, uh, involving your people in an exercise like this is critical. Don't do things to them. Help them to do it to themselves. You'll get uh, much greater collaboration, uh, much greater compliance if, um, if people are doing this themselves rather than having a consultant do it to them. So communication is about employing uh, strategies to keep, in, keep people informed, to tell them what your policy is, and to tell them who's involved, and to brief them on a regular basis about progress towards the results that you're wanting to achieve. I put in brackets there that there's a possibility that maybe you could include in this part of the exercise a staff suggestion scheme. Uh, your employees have all got ideas on how to improve your business and maybe leveraging those ideas in some respects could add some benefit to your um, business improvement strategy. Again, uh, this takes maybe about a month, but as I mentioned at the beginning, some of these things can happen in parallel. So while you're setting up your infrastructure, uh, you can actually also be setting up your communication strategy as well and delivering some of your communications. So now I'll move on to step five. Step five is foundation. Foundation is essentially about building something, a base if you like, on which you can build your organization's business improvement strategy. Now in my view, a good business foundation is around vision, mission and values. Uh, Every organization has got vision, mission, and values. Lots of organizations write them down. Some don't, but they still have them. There's maybe a word to be said here about what they mean, what we mean by the word. So a mission explain, explains why it is a business exists, what the business purpose is. It explains the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So for a bank, for example, um, 
Maybe you can help people manage their financial affairs. For a, an organization that builds roads, builds hospitals, and builds libraries and schools and so on, their mission might be about helping to build communities. It's about the day job. It's about doing the things that you're set up to deliver. Whereas if I go to number three, vision is slightly different. Vision is not about today. It's about the future. It's about maybe building roads and building hospitals, but building them in different ways, building them more efficiently, more effectively, more creatively in the future. So mission is about keeping the ship afloat. Vision is about maybe saying the ship that's to a place it's never been to before. Values are about emotion. Values are about behavior. It's essentially about the things that we do to each other. It's the way we relate to the people in our constituency, relate to each other as colleagues, relate to our vendors, relate to our customers, and relate to our business owners and society in general. So vision, mission, and values are an essential foundation on which you would build your business. And there are processes for doing that. You, know, you don't sit down and just write a mission. You don't sit down and write some values. You don't sit down and write a vision. There is a process to follow to develop these effectively. I would typically work with the top team to make sure that we've established these. And typically, it would take about a day, a, a day of workshops, to achieve a, a, a really solid foundation. Just um, as an aside to help you to remember about mission, values, and vision, it's about head, hands, and heart. So the mission is about hands, doing the day job. The vision is about the head. It's about thinking and planning and being creative. And the values are about the heart, the emotional side of the business. So head, hands, and heart, which is vision, mission, and values. Good way of remembering it. Okay, move on to stage six. Now, stage six is another T-I-O-N word, which is about justification. This is about establishing the business case. Obviously, there is a need to invest some funds in an exercise of this type. You need some resources. Uh, you can't invest funds without putting together some form of justification. So over the next period of time, in the steps that we're taking, we put together a number of business cases. The first one is typically called an initial business case. Pretty high level. It's only required to get you to a stage just prior to implementation. It says, I need some funds. I need to get to a situation where I understand something more about my business. I need some more insights into about my business issues, and I need some more insights into how we can improve the business. Once we've got to that stage, once we've got some initial funds, seed funding, if you like, to, um, to do that, then we will create a full business case. The full business case is lots of detail. It actually gives a promise. This is what we shall deliver in terms of improving the customer experience, maybe include improving the morale of our employees, maybe reducing our costs. They're the things that will be contained as a promise, if you like, that these are the results that will be delivered at the end of the exercise, and it will be what the project manager who is delivering this will be tested against at the end of the exercise. So justification contained in two documents, initial business case to get you to the first base, and then the full business case, which is the justification for investing in the whole project. I, I put down typically that takes about a month um, to put these cases together. I, I have to say my experience is that probably it takes longer than that. But you've got to put the, the work in here, uh, otherwise you don't get the funds. Now, once we've got some funds, we can start doing some mobilization we can get people. Once we've got funds to fund people, we can start making some appointments. We want a project leader. We want a steering committee set up. Um, the steering committee would typically be the top team. It doesn't have to be, but typically it would be the top team. Or it could be maybe just a small selection of the, the, the senior management team. Uh, but it's got to include the senior management team, particularly if you're doing something like an ISO certification, ISO 9000, uh, when the auditor comes along, they would be wanting to see how the senior team have committed themselves to this particular initiative. Without their commitment, you would not get certification. So you've got your resources, you've got a project leader, you've got your steering committee established, and you've got the funds to finance the project. 
getting all this together, mobilizing your people can take several weeks, but I put down here at least a week to get that uh, organized. Then we've got some calibration. Now, this is a bit of foundation work, if you like. This is about baselining. I think it would be really important at the end of an exercise of this nature, particularly if you're investing a serious amount of funds in a project of this type, to be able to evidence that you've actually made an improvement. You know, if, you, if you do an exercise like this, maybe take 12 months in doing it and investing a sub substantial amount of time and money, at the end of it, you want to show that you've increased maybe customer satisfaction, you've increased market share, you've increased sales, you've increased employee morale, you've reduced complaints, you've increased productivity, you've increased efficiency and so on. You need to evidence all those things without a starting point, without understanding today what your customer satisfaction level is, without understanding the number of complaints you have today, without understanding your market share and your sales, your complaints, your productivity. Without having that baseline, you'd have nothing to compare your end results with. You need a starting point. This is your baseline. If you don't have these numbers, spend time getting them. If you, don't, if you can't get them easily, have a plan to get them. But it's important that you get them during the early parts of the project because, as I said at the beginning, you need to evidence success. So that's calibration, calibrating where you are now so you can compare where you've got to in the future. Then we've got preparation. Uh, preparation is about preparing your people largely. You know, your organization is now going to be involved in a fairly uh, profound change management program. Uh, it could involve people's roles being changed. It most certainly will involve lots of changed processes. And when you change processes, often that means changing the way the organization is structured. If you're changing the way the organization is structured, you'll change people's roles. In order to do that effectively, you need people to be trained. One of the things that I like to do is to, change, to, to train people to become coaches. Coaching skills are the sort of skills that people need to manage change. It's non-directive. It's not about command and control. It's about more collaboration, more participation, and more involvement. Uh, I like that to be part of the preparation for a, uh, a project of this nature. And when I do this as a consultant, I always get all the managers to attend a two-day coaching uh, program. I also, as you can see there, uh, would like sponsors, whoever is, spon whoever is sponsoring the, uh, the project, to undertake some training as well. Typically, the sponsor is the person who's got the problem. The problem exists in his part of the business or her part of the business that we're addressing. And typically, the sponsor will be the chair of the steering committee. So the, re re the role of, and responsibilities of the sponsor sometimes needs to be reinforced with a, a short training program. Then we move on to education. And this is education for people who work on the project, but it can also include education for everybody in the organization. Uh, I said earlier on that it's not a good idea to do things to people. It's probably a better idea to help them to do things to themselves. So if you're wanting people to be collaborating with you in change, don't get the consultants or your quality team to do your process mapping and your flow charting and writing operating instructions. What you would better do, best be able to do, is to teach your staff to do flow charting, teach them to do process mapping, and teach them to write operating instructions, and then get them to do it themselves. You'll find that there's a great deal more collaboration, great deal more of compliance to um, change management when you do that. Typically, teaching people to do this sort of work, flow charting, process mapping, and so on, takes about two days. It depends on which approach you're taking, whether you're taking an approach of ISO or Six Sigma or Lean, but it's not a bad idea to think in terms of a two-day training program. So that's a sort of foundation education. Then we have a launch. This is essentially the first steering committee meeting where the project plan is presented by the project manager along with the project budget. This is really 
giving a presentation, looking for consensus, looking for authorization, and the authorization very often takes the form of the sponsor signing the plan, signing the deliverables, and signing off uh, the budget. It's half day, typically probably it's an hour or it's, it's a two hours rather than a half day, but it's best to leave half day for it just in case there is a need for further work. Okay, after stage 11, we've got stage 12, which is when the rubber hits the road. This is about execution or implementation. So we're going to now follow the plan. We're going to start introducing our ISO 9001 uh, accreditation. We're going to start maybe uh, doing our Six Sigma project. We're going to maybe start doing our Lean project or whatever it is we're doing. It's now execution time. I've put in here three to six months. Uh, that's probably minimum. If I was working with a company to implement, say, an ISO 9001 uh, certification program, it's probably 12 months. Depends on the maturity of the company and what they've done so far, but probably 12 months. If it was a Six Sigma program, you would probably be thinking about a minimum of six months. If it was a lean program, maybe you'd be thinking about three months. If it was a business excellence program where you're doing self-assessment against the European excellence model, again, that's probably a 12-month program. But I put three to six months minimum, but it depends on which particular methodology that you've chosen right at the beginning. Now, during implementation, other things can happen. So other things that I might be talking about may follow uh, along during this implementation stage. But number 13 is documentation. And as you can see, this is about writing down what it is that you're doing. If you're uh, designing new processes, you're changing processes, you need to actually document what it is you're doing. In ISO 9001, there are documentation standards, documentation control systems that you need to comply with. Uh, if you don't do it, you don't get certification. But it doesn't matter what system you're using, whether it's Lean or Six Sigma, uh, documentation is important. You need flow charts, you need um, process charts, process maps, and you need standard operating um, documentation so that everybody can, um, can have a, a, a foundation on which to uh, learn how to do the new process. So it's a foundation of training programs, it's a reference document for people who are, are working in the process so they can refer to something uh, when they, they need reminding about what's to be done and how it's to be done. This can be done obviously during stage 12, so it runs in parallel, but if you don't do it in parallel, at the end of the program you've got to spend some time documenting everything that's been done. Then we get into confirmation. Once we've finished the project, we're looking for an acceptance. So confirmation is at the end of the project, when it's completed, we need to confirm that the expected benefits have been captured. In other words, as the project leader, I would need to go to the steering committee and show evidence that those things that I'd committed to as the project leader at the beginning of the project, mentioned in the project plan, have been delivered. So I would be wanting to show recent evidence maybe of um, sales figures, recent evidence of uh, customer satisfaction, and show how we've actually improved both of those things, how we've improved employee morale, how we've reduced, reduced complaints, how we've reduced error rates, or whatever it is that we promised at the beginning. I would also be expecting, I think, to be pointing to where jobs have gone. So if I promised a reduction in headcount, I ought to be able to point to a number of chairs in the organization that are empty, or maybe a number of... Um, workstations that are, are no longer uh, staffed by people because we've reduced headcount. So it's about providing evidence that um, we've delivered to confirm that we've um, uh, delivered the promise. Usually half a day um, to demonstrate that. For some of the approaches that we would take, we've got also certification. Um, ISO 9001 is one of the things I've mentioned. Any other ISO program will result in a certification. Um, with ISO 9001, you 
do have to get involved in doing management review processes. Um, management review may take several days. You may have an internal audit. You may have an external audit. An external audit typically with ISO is a two-phase audit. So you'd have an auditors come in, come, auditors come in uh, may spend one, two, or three days doing an audit of your company, give you some feedback, and then they would come back maybe several days or several weeks later to make sure that you've taken on board the feedback, and they would then conduct the final audit, again, which could take one, two, or three days. So that's why I put in there three to six days. It's a two-stage process, and typically at the, the upper end is two, three days, so it's six days in total. There are other certificates that you can um, be awarded, and they would be certificates to do with, say, something like Six Sigma. If um, somebody is training to be a Six Sigma practitioner, they may become a green belt practitioner or a black belt practitioner, in which case they may be awarded at the end of this exercise a certificate in uh, green belt or a certificate in, in black belt. Okay, step 16 is migration. This is where we're trying to transfer learning. Uh, we're wanting to look at what we've learned as a consequence of improving processes with the project we've just terminated. And we would be looking to explore whether anything that we've learned during that project can be transferred to any other type, sorry, any other part of the business. Uh, so we would maybe be talking to other businesses about, or other parts of the business about some of their own problems just to see if we can migrate some of the, um, the benefits to that part of the business. Uh, my experience is that, yes, you can. Lots of these opportunities do migrate to um, other parts of the same business or even some businesses that are in the same family. I put down a month for that. It depends. It depends on how big the company is and how many opportunities there are. But you need to spend a bit of time to try and capture more benefits if you can. Which brings me to step 17, which is final completion. This is when we're going to close. Uh, the project is going to be shut down. Um, I like to think that when you're going to shut down a project, the, the people who've been working on the project, typically working part-time on it, maybe working on the project uh, as a, a secondment, are going off to do other things, and that the team is being broken up, and as a result, maybe they need to be saying goodbye to each other, in which case it's not a bad idea to have some sort of a celebration of success. Having a bit of a party is not a bad idea. Uh, it's a good message to send to people. It's a good way of saying thank you. And it's a good sort of sign-off to say, it's all finished, we're moving on to something else, and it's a, it's a way of um, psychologically indicating closure. Uh, it's at this, this particular award ceremony that maybe I would bring in the certification ceremony as well. So if the external organization is coming in to present us with a certificate, like maybe an ISO 9001 certificate, maybe they would come along and join the celebration of success. So you know, the highlight of the evening may be the, uh, the presentation of the certificate, uh, which no doubt is um, cause for celebration anyway. I put half day for that, but we're talking about maybe a couple of hours, maybe a couple of hours, one afternoon or one evening, uh, where people can get together and, um, and have a little bit of a party. OK, so that takes me to the end, the 17-step exercise. And now um, I'd start to look at any questions that you may have. So if anybody's got any questions, uh, I can't see any arising at the moment. Oh, wait a minute. There's um, actually somebody's asking a question about Six Sigma. Um, OK, in, in Six Sigma, I mentioned green belt and I mentioned black belt. Um, somebody's asking about green belts and black belts. Let me just explain what, where this came from. I mentioned earlier on that Six Sigma was created, the brand name for Six, Six, uh, Six Sigma was created by a company called Motorola, American company. Uh, the, uh, one of the directors was a guy called Bill Smith, and Motorola was probably 
collapsing, going out of business because of Japanese competition. Uh, Bill Smith understood what the Japanese were doing, uh, understood something about the Toyota production system, understood that Motorola had to go into major improvement activities, and he was looking for 100% improvement in business performance in a year. And having done that, he wanted to go for, in year two, another 100% improvement in business performance. So it was big improvements to keep the business in uh, to keep the business afloat. Bill Smith was a martial arts practitioner, so he understood about jiu-jitsu, yellow belt, green belt, black belts, and so on. And so he he coined the expression. Uh, he pinched the expression. He stole it, if you like, from Japanese martial arts. And what he decided to do was to um, award people a yellow belt once they'd been through two days of training. And that was basic training, the two days of training. Everybody in Motorola had two days of training and was given a yellow belt Six Sigma. Then he gave people further training. The people that were given further training were the managers and potentially some of the practitioners who were going to work full time. They were delivered another eight days training. Two days yellow belt, a further eight days training is 10 days in total. And when they had actually finished that 10 days training, they were given a project. When they fulfilled the project, they were then given or awarded the green belt. Some people went on to be black belt. And a black belt is a senior manager who's going to be, if you like, a project leader for Six Sigma. Green belts would work for a black belt. And that Six Sigma black belt would have to go through further training. And that training would involve another 10 days of training. So that's two days plus eight days plus 10 days is 20 days in total. After that, the, the black belt practitioner would have to do a six months training program, sorry, a six months project. And that six months project would be a project that delivers a half a million dollars worth of savings to the business. At the end of that, they would be awarded the black belt. So, okay, so the, the question was about what is yellow belt, green belt, and black belt. That's where it came from, and that's what it means. I, I can't see any other questions now. Nobody else is asking questions. I don't know whether that's because um, uh, I've covered everything that you want me to, and I've answered all your questions in this very short presentation. I rather feel that that would probably not be the case. Uh, maybe it's because you want to reflect on some of the things I've said, and you then want to raise questions later, in which case you are going to have, oh, wait a minute, somebody's asking a question. Can you please provide some examples to overcome conflicts of interest in orientation? Uh, conflicts of interest in orientation. Okay, that's a really good question. I think in the short answer is no, I can't. Um, I know what you mean. Conflicts of interest could be that certain managers would prefer one approach and other managers a, would prefer another. You know, some people might want to go for Six Sigma, some might want to go for Lean, some might want to go for ISO 9000. Um, I think my only approach to addressing that issue was to make some recommendations about reconciling the different approaches by taking all approaches and taking them in steps. So I would want to think about doing quick wins. The quickest wins I could do would be with Lean. So I'd, as a consultant, I'd make rec some recommendations. I would recommend, let's go with Lean first, then let's go with Six Sigma, then let's go with ISO 9000, and then let's go with Business Excellence. When going with those three on the way, I'd potentially use a balanced scorecard as well. So I guess I'd probably point out to them what my personal experience is and give them my personal recommendation. I'm not sure it's going to resolve the conflict, but I can't think of any other way of doing it, actually. I hope that answers your question. Of course, you can have a copy of the presentation. We'll be sending um, a link. Um, in, within the next two days, 
uh, you'll have an email. The email will be uh, offering to you a, a link that you can click on. It will take you to not only the presentation, but it will also give you an insight into a podcast. So if you'd like to hear my dulcet tones again, then you can have this repeated. Of course, we, there's all sorts of other things we can do for you. you know, we've got training programs. We've got consultancy support that we can offer to you. All you need to do is engage with us, and we, we'll um, commit to actually delivering whatever it is that, uh, that you want. We've got lots of resources here, lots of people who can do things for you. All you need to do is ask. All I need to do then is say goodbye. Uh, I've enjoyed this last um, 45 minutes or thereabouts talking to you. I hope it's given you some insights into developing a strategy for your business. It's only a starting point. It's only 45 minutes. Uh, there's a lot more that we can do for you, so please be in touch. And whatever it is that you do, good luck.